Hello, my name is Matt DeBergelis. I'm the CTO of Apollo GraphQL. We're the open source company that created GraphQL Federation and brought GraphQL to the enterprise. You've heard that GraphQL is the hot API technology, and I'm here today to talk about its future in an AI-enabled era. To set the stage for that, let me start for just a minute with where it is today. We have a bird's eye view of this at Apollo, and what we've seen across so much of the industry is a remarkable number and variety of companies that have made big strategic investments in a GraphQL federation layer. Whether retail or media or banking or so many other verticals, what's driving this is a common need to combine hundreds, even thousands of business and domain APIs together and to build world-class customer experiences on top of that. Not just once or twice, but repeatedly, faster than the competition and at a lower and lower cost. Personalization, omnichannel, M&A, these are all trends that have driven the urgency and the conviction behind GraphQL Federation. And now the biggest trend of all is here and it's AI. AI to me is really the next step of personalized experiences. And it's clear to me that customers are going to expect them. They're going to demand AI enabled experiences from their brands and they're gonna vote with their feet should they not get them. Apps of course are built on our APIs. And so I'm just saying what all of us here already know, tomorrow's AI experiences will be built on today's APIs. And what that means is we need an AI strategy for our APIs. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Here's what's not going to work is not having a strategy. It may be tempting to imagine the LLM calling your APIs directly. That's essentially the plugin approach. And it can work in a limited setting when the AI only knows about one or two APIs, but it's not going to work at scale. There's two problems. The first is you need a way to enforce policy. An AI is like giving every user their own custom application with new and novel workflows that the customer events on the fly. And so we can't rely on the usual places like application code or integration APIs to limit the sorts of API calls that a user might make and in what combination. The other problem is it just doesn't work. LLMs don't actually have the reasoning capability to precisely sequence a set of API calls where the result of one feeds into the input to a second in a very particular and precise way. You can verify this for yourself by opening your favorite Copilot tool and asking it to write code to do this. Essentially, ask Copilot to write a BFF for you. And what you'll find is that the code it writes is almost right and that almost right code is completely useless. So what we need therefore is some kind of an AI orchestration, an architecture that integrates the AI into the API stack. And the idea of AI orchestration isn't new. Retrieval augmented generation, RAG, is probably the best example of such an idea. And RAG is great when you wanna integrate a model with private data perhaps from a knowledge base or a customer support system. The idea of RAG is that you retrieve relevant documents from your database, augment the user's prompt with the contents of those documents, and then have the model generate a result that incorporates that additional information. But RAG won't work for us here. Its limitations, what it can't do, are exactly what APIs are for. APIs are about dynamic experiences, real-time transactional information with complex requirements and policies, and ultimately not just reads, but writes. And so what we're hunting for is something new, akin to RAG, but for an API-based architecture rather than for databases. And what I think is gonna work for us is the federated GraphQL layer. This is what all of those companies I mentioned earlier have built. It's a new layer of the stack that abstracts away the details of domain and business APIs. And the huge value of such a layer 
is that you don't have to ask someone to write integration code every time you need a new combination of APIs to power an experience. The graph is a self-service platform, and all you do is write a query, a declarative description of the data that you need. GraphQL is the language we use to write that query, very much akin to SQL for databases. And just like databases, at the heart of a GraphQL Federation implementation is a query planner, which knows how to turn the intent of the query into a precise set of API calls, joins, and filters to return the correct result to the client. So here's a typical example. What we see is a query plan from Apollo that first fetches data from a hotel service and then uses some property of the hotel service response as a foreign key to fetch additional information from real-time pricing as well as a service that contains user-supplied reviews. And crucially, in this particular query plan, those second two API calls can proceed in parallel. It makes sense, once you have the initial key, there's no dependency between the two. And that's the sort of an optimization that a query planner does as part of its job. And query plans can get fairly sophisticated. By adding a hint to the query, we can instruct Apollo's query planner to return portions of the data asynchronously. This defer operation is a common pattern when you have a slow service that would impact the time to interaction of an application. So instead of writing piles of imperative code to juggle this precise sequencing of fetches to different APIs, we just write one extra line of GraphQL and the query planner does everything else that we need. Like other platforms, what used to be code can now be configuration in this sort of approach. So for example, policy enforcement. The Apollo Query Planner understands how to require a particular scope so that it can limit certain operations depending on the credential that the user supplies at the time they execute the query. In this example, the query plan is formed, but because the scope doesn't include the required credential, the query plan doesn't execute and, and the graph turns out to be the right place that we can do this sort of policy enforcement because it's semantic. The point I make with all this is that a lot more of this sort of thing is coming and the roadmap for the query planner is going to get a lot more sophisticated over time. And here's the punchline. The query planner is great at exactly what the LLM can't do. And that lets us use the LLM for exactly what it does best, generative AI. We call the idea text to query, and it's just what it says on the tin. You take a natural language request, combine it with the GraphQL schema, and out comes a query. That's the text that the LLM creates and then feeds into the query planner, which validates the query plan, enforces policy, and then sequences the various API calls and returns the result. Essentially, we're splitting responsibilities here a creative right brain stage, which I've helpfully put on the left side of the slide, and then a rigorous left brain stage for query execution. And the two go together incredibly well. Let me show you what that looks like in practice. So what we've done here is taken this architecture and run it on top of the GitHub public GraphQL API. And we'll start with a very simple example. Let's just get the title and author of the 10 most recent issues filed against the Open API Specification Repository. The LLM has written a query. And you can see that the LLM did a lot of creative work here as part of that. So it understands, for example, how to take the full OAI slash repository name and break that into the two required arguments for the query. It understands which fields we wanted back from the domain model and it understands how to construct from all of those things a valid GraphQL query against the GitHub schema. And of course, we can run that query and we get back exactly what we looked for. So this is a simple example. Let me show you a more sophisticated example. Same exact idea, same tools. This time, we're gonna ask for some of the comments that have been made on recent issues in the repository. Again, here's the prompt, and here's the query that the LLM returns. This is the text to query part. What's 
interesting here isn't just that the query is more sophisticated. There's a nuance here, which is that if we were to fetch this data using GitHub's REST API, what we would find is that the comments that we want back actually come from a different API endpoint than the repository. So this query illustrates the full power of having a query planner as part of the architecture. The same declarative description of what we're fetching is doing a lot more work on the query execution side of the house. And again, we run that query and we get back exactly what we're looking for. So let me show you the moving parts behind the curtain here. There's two big pieces to the architecture that makes possible what you just saw. The first piece on the bottom of the slide is essentially a schema embedding system. This is actually a RAG architecture. And what we're doing is we're taking the full schema, in GitHub's case, over 800 different business objects, what we call types in GraphQL. We're breaking that schema into chunks and we're running it through an embedding model and then storing that in a vector database. Importantly, we re-embed schema as it changes and only the parts that changed. And the reason that's so important is that in the enterprise, graphs aren't just large, they change frequently. In a self-service platform model, you're typically iterating on the graph every day. And so the vector database contains an always up-to-date embedding of the GraphQL schema that's relevant. Like any RAG implementation, that's a fixed experience. It does one thing, but the experience is quite general because it's a machine for allowing an LLM to construct a query based on a user prompt. And that's the second half of the architecture. So in the top of the diagram is where you'll see that when we receive a prompt from the user, we first fetch what we are knowing to be relevant parts of the schema out of that vector database. And we run that through a second model along with the user's prompt. That's the model that outputs a query, which then goes to the router for query planning and execution. This is not tuned for one particular schema. Yelp also happens to have a public GraphQL schema, and here's what we can do on Yelp. So this time we're gonna ask for a highly rated sushi restaurant recommendation. We want three options and we want to include some reviews for each so that we can eyeball what it is we're looking at. Once more, here's the query that the LLM emits. This is the same machinery just operating on top of a database that has the embeddings of the Yelp GraphQL API. And when we run that query, here's the result, just as you'd expect. What's so interesting about this one to me is how humanizing it starts to feel. I like GitHub as an example because it's a domain model that we're all familiar with, but it's, it's this kind of interaction that I think starts to hint at the sorts of experiences that we can have with an AI on top of API implementation and how valuable that's going to be for customers and for users. That's what I think is so exciting here. It's a glimpse at a new kind of application, a freedom from pre-built experiences. Imagine a travel experience that starts by saying, hey, I've got a couple weeks free in June. I want to visit Taiwan, maybe also Japan. I've got two little kids. Can you suggest some itineraries with flight and hotel availability? Or imagine a prompt that says, I want to go see Oppenheimer in 70 millimeter IMAX. Please book me the next show on a Thursday where I can get four seats together, but at least five rows back from the front. That's what's coming. I think we can all see it. And GraphQL Federation gives us an architecture that allows us to build those sorts of experiences on top of the APIs that we have today and the investments that we've made over the years. It's really about a new way of interacting with businesses, not just applications. So how do we get from here to there? This is our vision at Apollo for how this sort of AI gets rolled out. And it's a low trust, to high trust vision. So you start with a low trust approach. You take everything we've seen here and you use it to accelerate your application development. Imagine going into your VS Code editor and when it's time to build a new experience, all you do 
is hit Command-K and type in English what it is you're trying to build. Not just the demos you've seen of the UI getting built by the AI, but now we also have all of the machinery for wiring that UI up to the actual APIs, to the business capabilities that you have. That's a good starting point because you don't have to have a lot of trust for the machinery. An engineer is going to inspect those results before putting them into production, but it's an enormous time saver and it changes the way you think about application development. From there, as we gain experience and trust with the system, and as we build more policy capability in the query planning layer of the graph, we can do more and start to have customer-facing AI-enabled experiences, perhaps first as a read-only experience, and then down the road, AI-enabled transactions, where I can actually book the restaurant reservation, I can make my travel reservations, and I can make the sorts of changes in my environment based on that same kind of human interaction with the business. And ultimately, of course, agents, a world where the customer is going to bring their own LLM. This is the highest trust regime because now, of course, we have to have all of the policy and architectural structure in place to be able to work with any LLM and an LLM that we haven't fine-tuned or can't directly trust. So that's the path. And it's what we believe is coming. The next gen API platform that capitalizes on AI is Apollo Federation. And if you're thinking about this kind of direction, if you're interested in working with us on this, come see us at the booth. We're so excited to do this with you. Thanks and enjoy the conference.